Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning. It's my pleasure to introduce Martin Heirer, who will be giving the plenary lecture this morning. Uh, he will be speaking about random loops, which, yeah, it's already up there, so I don't have to repeat that. So Martin Heyer was a student of Jean-Pierre Ekman. He won the Fields Medal in 2014 for his work on stochastic PDE, and he's now a professor at Imperial College in London. Martin Heyer. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Uh, whoa, this is pretty loud. Um, okay, thank you very much for the uh, really kind introduction. And uh, so before I start, I'd really like to thank the organizers of this uh, extremely well-organized conference. So I have to say that this is probably one of the best organized conferences that I've ever been to. Um, and so it's even more impressive that it seems to be essentially organized single-handedly by Christoph. Um, so the, uh, the work I want to talk about today, it's a sort of joint work with uh, Ivan Brunet, uh, who, is now in, who is now in Edinburgh, uh, Frank Gabriel, who is now at EPFL in Lausanne, um, and Lorenzo Zambotti from Paris. And it's, uh, so maybe some of you have heard me talk about it. So it's something that we've been thinking of for a while and we had some partial results. Um, but now we sort of, I think maybe about sort of four or five months ago, so we finally, in some sense, understood the full picture. Um, and so the question that you start from, so let's say, um, take, so imagine you have a Riemannian manifold. Uh, so it could be a surface, but it doesn't have to be two-dimensional. Okay, the dimension doesn't really matter. Um, and then you imagine something like a rubber band on that manifold. This thing is a bit annoying. Uh, so imagine something like a rubber band on that manifold, so just a function from the circle into the manifold. Um, now, of course, there's, if you have such a rubber band, there's a natural notion of energy that's associated with it. Um, you can imagine this energy, you know, imagine that your rubber band is really made of so finitely many beads that are connected by springs, and then the energy would be something like the potential energy stored in these springs. Um, and mathematically, it would be something like uh, <clears throat> you go along the circle and you integrate, so x would be um, the variable that parametrizes sort of the circle. And then what you integrate is you take the derivative, so at every point you look at the tangent vector here, uh, along the curve, and you stick this into the metric at that point, okay? So that's some sort of like a little infinitesimal squared length, uh, and you integrate this along the loop. So that's a natural notion of energy. Um, and of course, with this notion of energy, there's a natural evolution that goes with it, which is usually called the heat flow or something like that, which is essentially just the L2 gradient flow uh, for that energy. Um, but now, well, if you're interested in probability, when you see an energy and something like a gradient flow, you think of zero temperature. And then, of course, what you're interested in is the finite temperature case. Okay, so the finite temperature, um, well, at finite temperature, you should think that there's something like a Gibbs measure, which has density e to the minus energy with respect to some sort of Lebesgue measure. Um, all right, so you should think of having some measure on the space of loops, and formally, so that measure, there is a natural measure on the space of loops, which, uh, which we already know, uh, which is essentially given by take a Brownian motion on your manifold, and so the Brownian motion, you can characterize it, for example, by just saying it's the Markov process that has the Laplace Beltrami operator as its generator. Um, and then you condition it to return to its starting point at time, say at time one or two pi, depending on uh, how you like your variables to look like. Um, and then you can kind of choose the starting point in such a way, because you see, so that gives you a measure on loops, 
but it's not really a measure on loops, it's a measure on pinned loops because you've sort of singled out uh, the starting point, right? And there's actually a unique way of choosing the law of the starting point in such a way that the measure you get is invariant under just rotation of the loop, right? So under kind of reparametrization of the circle that's just a rotation by a fixed angle, okay? So there's a unique way of doing that, and that gives you a very natural measure uh, on your space of loops. And, well, if you go to the uh, sort of physics literature in the 70s, um, they discuss that measure because it's some sort of analog of the Feynman path integral measure, and they write this kind of expression for it. So you have e to the minus exactly the same energy as I wrote on the previous slide. But they actually, the interesting thing is, depending on which paper you look at, there's an extra term that goes with it, uh, which is a constant times the integral of the scalar curvature of your manifold along the loop. And the funny thing is that, so, so you can actually find theorems uh, that suggest it, right? It's not completely clear what this means, because here this is supposed to be Lebesgue measure, and there's no Lebesgue measure on the space of loops. Um, and actually, there are various theorems that suggest that something like this is true. Um, but even at the level of you know, actual mathematical rigorous theorems, it suggests different values for that constant C. Okay, so for example, uh, there's a theorem by, well, it's called the onsager machlup formula. It goes back to 53, but it's really a theorem by Takahashi and Watanabe from 81, which suggests C equal one over 12. So what that theorem says is, well, take a fixed smooth loop, Okay, look at a little uh, tube of size epsilon around that loop. Look at the measure of that tube under this Brownian loop measure. So that's going to be very small if the diameter of that tube is very small. But now you take two smooth functions. Okay, you take around each of them, you take a little tube of size epsilon. You look at these two measures and you compare them. Now the ratio is going to converge to something finite as epsilon goes to zero. And that something finite will be precisely something like this, a ratio of two expressions like this, uh, with u replaced by the two smooth loops that you've chosen, uh, and c equal 1 over 12. Um, there's another theorem from the uh, late 90s by, oops, there's two theorems actually, by Anderson and Driver, and they suggest that c is either 0 or 1 over 6. Um, again, depending on how you interpret this kind of Lebesgue measure. Um, and in the physics literature, you get all sorts of values. So there's a paper by De Witt which suggests C equal minus one over 12, and I think this is not a typo, so it's really sort of the same one over 12, but with opposite signs. Uh, then there's a later paper by De Witt again, which suggests one over eight. Uh, there's a paper by Decker that suggests minus one over eight. <laughs> And so on. So it sort of really depends a little bit on how you interpret uh, what you mean by Lebesgue measure on the space of loops. But basically, everybody agrees that the natural measure is something like that with some value of c. Okay? So that's something that everybody agrees on. Um, and so, so now, once you have a, if you have a probability measure like that, sort of given as a kind of Gibbs measure, um, there's a natural evolution that you would like to build, which goes with it, which is you know, something like the uh, Langevin equation that goes with this measure. Um, now, formally, here in local coordinates, you can write down some stochastic PDE, which at some sort of formal level should preserve that measure. Um, so what that means is that, well, if you have an equation of the type e to the minus v of x dx, just on Rn, okay? Um, then if you write the stochastic PD, which is just the L2 gradient flow plus a white noise, then that PD, uh, that SD, that stochastic differential equation, preserves the measure e to the minus v, or e to the minus 2v, actually. Um, and if instead of having a measure on Rn, you have a measure on a manifold, you can do the same thing, uh, but it's just that well, your noise now, it has to sort of live in the tangent space, and so you have to, you know, it's kind of 
it's a little bit more complicated to actually formulate what you mean by your SD and your gradient. You have to somehow choose a notion of gradient which is compatible with the sort of strength of the noise or the covariance that you choose for your noise. But again, you can show that you know, the measure that you started from is invariant for the SD that you write down. And if you formally do the same thing, well, here it's no longer an SD because it, but an SPD because the measure is not a measure on just Rn or a manifold, but it's a measure on functions. Okay, so at fixed time, your state space would already be a space of loops. Um, and so here, the SPD that you would formally write down is something like that. So, so let me just try to pass this. Um, so on the left, you have some, so if this were all zero, this would just be a heat equation, okay? Except that, of course, you know, heat equation here doesn't make any sense because I put myself into some kind of local coordinate system, uh, just the heat equation is not invariant under changes of coordinates, okay? So that would not be a natural evolution because it would actually depend on the coordinate system that you choose. Uh, if you add this extra term here, where the gammas are the Christoffel symbols uh, for your metric, then if you chop the equation here, you just look at this. This is something like a nonlinear modification of the heat equation, which now is invariant under changes of coordinates. Okay, so this bit here is really just the L2 flow, the L2 gradient flow for this energy. Okay, it's nothing else than that. Um, and then, well, this here is just the gradient of that, right? So if I add this extra term, it's the gradient flow for this whole energy. Um, and then this is just the noise. And the noise, you want to have it sort of adapted to the Riemannian structure of your manifold. And so what it means is that at any point u, the noise should you know, only act sort of in the, in the direction of the tangent space at u. And so one way you could enforce that is you take a bunch of vector fields, sigma i, which have the property that if you take sigma i tensor sigma i, you get the inverse metric tensor. And so then you think of the inverse metric tensor as being like the covariance of the noise, and you stick a noise here which has basically that covariance. Okay, so that would be sort of a natural uh, evolution on the space of loops. Uh, and the xi i's here, now they are not just white noises in time, but they are white noises in space-time. Okay, so it's basically like having independent white noises in time at every point of space. Um, so let me just show you what the... So you can simulate this, you get something like that. Okay, so here your manifold is a sphere. Uh, you start with some sort of loop. You, let, you stick this into a computer, you let it run, you get some kind of evolution like that, okay? Um, so here you see that it more or less collapses. So if it didn't have the noise, then it would be like a smoothened out version of this. Uh, so this heat flow would essentially either collapse to a point or it would collapse to a closed geodesic. But of course on the sphere, the only closed geodesics are sort of the equators and they are unstable, so you would basically never see them. Right? So here it would, unless you choose your initial condition very carefully, the deterministic evolution would just collapse to a point. Um, and the stochastic one, of course, doesn't because you keep on pumping noise into the system, and so you always sort of push it out, so it never collapses to a point. Uh, but it's the, so if you continued the movie, it would sort of look, it would look always more or less like this, right? So it would sort of move around, but always look roughly the same. Uh, one thing you notice here is that the, uh, that function looks pretty regular, right? So it's a, at any fixed time, um, this here is a curve. Well, so remember, we sort of conjectured that the invariant measure should be this Brownian loop measure, okay? And so at any fixed time, this should actually look like a Brownian loop, which is basically just a Brownian motion condition to return to where it started. So it should look like a Brownian motion. Okay, and Brownian motion, uh, we know that, it had, well, we already saw in Stas's talk uh, that Brownian motion, the paths of Brownian motion, they are Helder continuous of every exponent less than a half, but they're actually not one half Helder. Okay, so the regularity uh, of this curve is essentially Helder half. Okay, but no more than that. Um, 
Now, so you can think of this as being a limit of discrete systems, right? So if you uh, remember at the beginning, I told you you can think of this rubber band as some sort of collection of beads that are connected by springs. Um, and then the evolution here would be essentially, you know, you have these springs, there's a, at every point, there's a force exerted onto this spring by its two neighbors. Um, you look at the overdamped dynamic, so there's no inertia, so you just follow uh, that as a sort of velocity field. Uh, but then you add some random noise to this, uh, and you stick independent noises on every bead, um, and you choose the covariance of the noise in such a way that it's round, if you want, in the intrinsic metric of the tangent space at that point. Okay? Um, and in order to formally get the equation that I wrote on the previous slide, you actually have to choose these noises extremely strong. So in the sense that if you, if you put one over epsilon beads on your curve so that the distance, well, the distance between beads on the circle would be epsilon. So because the thing is going to be uh, one half holder, means that the actual distance on the manifold would be only about square root epsilon between beads, well, it would be, right, so it would be larger. Uh, and the strength of the noise would be actually of the order one over square root epsilon. So you put some extremely strong noise on each of these beads, and the only reason why the whole thing doesn't just completely fly apart, um, well, is because of the interaction with the neighbors that kind of keeps the thing together, right? So there's kind of a competition between the strength of the noise and the strength of the second derivative, if you want, that sort of tries to keep things together. And it turns out that this is the correct noise strength so that these balance out, okay? Right. Um, um, okay, and so then again here, I just mentioned again what we had on the previous slide. So, so now this has, of course, been somewhat studied before. So on the deterministic level, so this heat flow was actually introduced by Is and Sampson uh, in the mid-60s. Uh, so they introduced that for sort of completely different reasons. I don't really want to go into details. Um, there's some early work by Funaki in the early 90s who tried to basically construct the evolution that I just described to you. Um, but at the time, the sort of tools that we have now weren't available, and so he had to restrict himself to, in some sense, very smooth noises. Uh, so he couldn't deal the case where you make them independent on each beat, but you had to kind of correlate them very strongly uh, so that your random loop is much more regular. Um, there's a, so here I formulated everything in some sort of, as some kind of L2 gradient, right? So you could formulate everything as a kind of H1 gradient. Um, the thing that you get there doesn't look like a PD anymore, okay, in the sense that the right-hand side would not be something local anymore. So here, what I wrote is purely local. So the right-hand side at a point U depends only, um, I mean, at a point X, if you want, depends only on the solution at that point and the derivative of the solution at that point. So there's no convolution operator or anything on the right-hand side. If you write the whole thing as an H1 gradient, then, of course, you have, you know, something non-local appearing on the right-hand side, but it actually makes everything much more regular. So then the analogous evolution was actually built in the 90s by uh, a number of people. Um, and the thing is, so now there's a kind of general black box uh, type theory, which uh, I've developed over the last sort of six years with a number of co-authors. Um, and this black box theory is precisely designed to deal with equations of that type, okay? So in principle, the black box theory just gives you a notion of solution. Um, but of course, if that was all that there was to say to it, then the talk would finish now somehow, and uh, there wouldn't be any, anything interesting to say. So the, we'll see in a second that there is a subtlety. Um, and. Uh, so even though this theory gives you kind of notions of solution, uh, we'll see that in this particular case, it's not satisfactory and uh, you want to kind of know more. Um, then there's actually an alternative approach which is solved via Dirichlet forms, um, which people have looked at um, a couple of years ago. Um, but that doesn't 
And so somehow the technology there doesn't really seem to be sufficiently advanced to really exhibit, uh, you know, to actually say anything precise on the process that you end up constructing. Um, and even uniqueness is actually not clear at all. So, so let me just mention now that general black box kind of result. Okay, so that general black box result says something along the following lines. Okay, so, um, so again here I wrote down the same equation as before. Uh, the difference is that here instead of adding on the right hand side this sort of constant times gradient scalar curvature, I just put an arbitrary vector field. Okay, I just call it H. Think of H as being, for example, gradient or scalar curvature, but it could be any vector field on your manifold. Um, and then <clears throat> let me write U epsilon for sort of some approximate solution theory. So what I mean by this is, for example, there's different ways of approximating it. For example, you could think of approximating it by having these one of epsilon beads, or you could think of a continuum approximation uh, where you replace your white noise by some smoothened out noise at some scale epsilon. Right? So think of the second one, so that's the one which is technically easier. So you have some sort of epsilon approximation, and then that epsilon approximation gives you a solution theory, and the solution theory is a map that takes as an input kind of the ingredients of the right-hand side, which is the gamma, the sigma, and the h, and then what it spits out is basically a Markov process. We'll say transition probabilities for a Markov process or something along these lines, or maybe something that assigns to every initial condition the law of the solution, okay? Um, so now what this black box theorem says is the following. So it says, okay, so to, this, to a class of equations like this, uh, you can associate a sort of finite collection of symbols and, well, so here these symbols, well, okay, there's a rule for generating them, so you can sort of see here that they are basically trees with sort of two types of nodes, so they're either these round nodes, or there are nodes that are sort of these, you know, the ones that are at the bottom of sort of two red lines. And so here you have two types of lines also, you have the red lines and the sort of thin lines, and there are some rules that govern them, so for example, uh, red lines always come in pairs, and they're always at the bottom of a pair of red lines. You always have one of these sort of uh, small nodes rather than one of these thick round nodes. And then the round nodes are sort of paired up in pairs. So for example, here there's one pair and the second pair, there's this pair and this pair. Okay, so that gives you some kind of combinatorial structure. And you look at all the trees like that, which have at most four of these kind of big round nodes. It turns out that there's 54 of them. Okay, so that's sort of, the theory basically gives you some kind of combinatorial structure that's associated to your class of equations, and this is the combinatorial structure here. Um, and then what it tells you is, well, furthermore, it comes with some sort of evaluation map which turns each of these symbols into uh, a smooth function, or so a smooth function from Rn to Rn which depends still on the ingredients. So it actually depends on the gamma and on the sigma. And the way you build it is you basically think of each of these round nodes as being a sigma. Uh, you think of each sort of down-facing line, uh, up-facing line from a round node as representing a derivative. And then um, sort of connections are contractions of indices. And the other type of nodes with the two red lines, you should think of them as being gammas. And again, so the gammas have sort of two upper indices and one lower index. And so the two upper indices are represented by the two red lines that come up. And the lower index is somehow by the, represented by a sort of the, uh, well, no, it's the other way around. So, sorry, the two lower indices are represented by the red lines. The upper index is represented by sort of whatever comes in. Um, and then you have contraction. So for example, this here, what this represents is you take a sigma, you differentiate it. When you differentiate it, that creates an extra lower index. And then that lower index, you contract it with another sigma, which is the one here. And these two sigmas, because they are paired up, they have the same i and you sum over i again. Okay, so you have sort of a recipe like this. 
that cooks up for each of these symbols um, some function from Rn from the gamma and the sigma, okay? Uh, and you call that epsilon. And then what the theorem tells you is that you know, you choose these guys in any way you want, smooth. Um, and then you can find constants. So I view these constants now as being a formal linear combination of these symbols. Okay, you look at the vector space generated by these symbols. It's a vector space of dimension 54. Um, so the claim is that there exists elements of this vector space which depend on epsilon and typically diverge as epsilon goes to zero. So that if you modify the equation by adding to H uh, this evaluation applied to these vectors, then that actually has a limit. Okay? And then you can call that limit if you want the solution to the equation. Um, now, of course, you know, this looks like a weird notion of solution. right? Um, and it's not terribly satisfactory because well, it still, it sort of depends on this choice of these constants, right? So it tells you that there's a way of choosing them so that this limit exists. Um, but then if you choose them in a certain way, well, you can also choose them in a slightly different way, right? You could add one to one of the constants or something like that, and the limit would actually still exist. Uh, so it doesn't actually give you a unique solution theory, but it really gives you a whole family of solution theories that's parametrized by, you know, 54 constants or something like that, okay? And so that's why I was saying that this is, okay, so you have a black box theorem that tells you that, and I don't want to say anything about the proof of that theorem, um, but in this case, it's really not satisfactory because it doesn't give you a solution, but it gives you something like a 54-dimensional family of things that you might call solutions, okay? And that's, of course, not really what you want. Um, now, I want to make so first two remarks on that still. So the first remark is that the, uh, the limit that you get is actually extremely stable. So this here, uh, the limiting object is really continuous in all arguments. And it's continuous sort of in a strong sense, in the sense that you can even, on the right-hand side, you could make these gammas and the sigmas depend on epsilon, for example and still as long as they converge to a limit in you know, some topology of sufficiently smooth functions, uh, this limit is the same as the one that you get uh, you know, if you fix them to the limiting values to start with, um, which is not obvious, right, because these constants diverge, and so you have, you know, you have some convergence of these gammas and sigma, but the convergence is allowed to be slower than the speed at which these constants diverge, and so when you compare this guy with gamma epsilon, for example, to this guy with the limiting gamma, they differ by something which is divergent here, right? We, they might differ by something divergent, but the claim is still that the limit is the same, okay? So there's a strong stability here, which is not trivial at all from somehow the statement of the solution, of the uh, theorem. Um, and that's where we're going to make use of that very strongly. Um, and there's a second comment I wanted to make, which is, well, basically, where do these, uh, where does this thing sort of come from, right? So where do these additional terms here come from? Um, and this is, in some sense, you can view it as an argument which is very similar to this uh, renormalization group picture a la Wilson that Stas uh, mentioned in his lecture on Tuesday morning. Um, so in this case, right, so what, what happens is that you, um, you want to construct something like a solution to, to this equation driven by white noise. Now, white noise has randomness sort of at all scales, right? Because it's white, it basically means that its Fourier transform is just completely flat, right? The spectrum is somehow the same uh, at every k. Um, so it has information at all scales. Now what you do is you put a cutoff somewhere at some scale epsilon, and then you sort of start to fill in the scale, sort of scale by scale, right? So you, you, you want to study what happens as you remove that cutoff, so you kind of start to fill in an information scale by scale, um, and then what you do is you ask yourself what sort of the effect, so you add this very small scale information 
to the noise, right, so of some information at some scale epsilon. And then you ask yourself, what's the effect of that on the solutions at sort of scales of order one? And what you see is that since the noise is actually very strong at small scales, remember in the picture of the beads, it's a one over square root epsilon kind of strength, okay? So the noise is very strong. So it actually has a pretty big effect uh, at order one scales. And so if you don't do anything about that, there's no reason at all why this should converge to any kind of limit. Um, and so what happens here is that this term here essentially cancels out that effect to some sort of dominant order uh, in the limit as sort of the small the separation between the scale at which you observe and the scale at which you add information goes to infinity. Okay, um, so you think of you sort of add more and more information at smaller and smaller scales. This wants to make the solution at scales of order one just fly away, and so what you do is you simultaneously slightly change your equation in order to try to kind of stabilize what happens at scales of order one. Okay? Uh, and so the effect of this is precisely to sort of do that stabilization. Um, and then of course you would say, well, but this is completely cheating because you, you, know, you totally changed the equation that you started from, so what does this have to do with the equation that you started from, right? It doesn't mean anything. Um, well, so what you should really think of, the picture you should have in mind is that what you're interested, so for example, as a physicist, what you're interested is never really sort of one single equation, right? You always have a physical theory. The physical theory depends sort of on constants that you have to determine experimentally. So it's always that you actually have a whole family of equations, right? And then you make predictions that sort of depend on which element of the family you've chosen, okay? Um, and then these predictions sort of, once you have enough experiments also, it allows you to actually determine which point in the space of possible equations you're actually looking at. And what's often important is not so much the uh, specific equations of like the exact form of the equation that you're looking at, but it's rather sort of the structure of the space of equations. And so what you want then is a structure is a sort of space of solutions which has something to do with the equations and kind of respects in some sense, the formal expressions that you would write down, um, but you're not so much interested in, in some sense, uh, giving a literal sense, giving kind of a literal meaning to the equation, okay, if you see what I mean. Um, and so it's the same here. So what you're really interested in is the family of equations. So it's the fact that for every choice of gamma, h, and sigma, you do have a solution theory, and it still has something to do with that gamma, that h, and that sigma, and sort of reflect something of the structure of the original equation. And we'll see that uh, it's possible to do that. So, so now remember, okay, so this is not very satisfactory because it's really not canonical, okay? So there's somehow 54 degrees of freedom, which a priori we don't know how to choose. Um, and now the other thing with respect to what I just said, is that, well, the important thing is that you would want sort of formal calculations to be true. And what this means is that you would want formal identities, uh, say, between the equations in your class to actually hold. And there are two formal identities that you can find here. So the first one is that the class, if the class of equations we're looking at is invariant under changes of diffeomorphism, right? So if I, or equivariant, if you want. And in the sense that if I write my system in a different coordinate system, I'm going to write down a different equation, but it's going to be an equation of the same form. And I know how to change coordinates on the gammas and the sigmas and the h's, right? Because I know that the gammas are Christoffel symbols, so they transform in a certain way, and the sigmas and the h's are vector fields, so they transform in a certain way, okay? So I know the rules for transforming under changes of coordinates, right? But now, so here there's a non-trivial property because I can do change of coordinates in two different ways. So I can either solve the equation in the original coordinate system and just look at its image on the new coordinate system, or I can change the coordinates, it gives me a new equation, and I solve that equation in the new coordinate system, and I would want the two to give the same answer, right? Um, 
And now, in the way that we've built solutions here, there's no reason why this would be true, because it was, we wrote everything down in sort of local coordinates. The theory doesn't know anything about geometry. It's sort of completely agnostic to the type of equation you're looking at. So it has no reason to actually be invariant under changes of coordinates. Right? So you can ask yourself, in that 54-dimensional space of solution theories, are there some that are actually equivariant under changes of coordinates? Right? So they would be sort of natural candidates for solutions. And then there's another thing, is that, well, remember, we chose these sigmas in such a way that sort of sigma tensor sigma gives you the inverse metric tensor, but that wasn't unique at all. Right? So there are lots of different choices of these vector fields sigma that have the property that you know, sum of sigma i tensor sigma i gives you the inverse metric. And again, formally, by some kind of ethos formula or sort of just reasoning on the covariances of Gaussians, we would expect that the law of the solution doesn't actually depend on that choice. Okay? And so again, the way we've built it, there's no reason that this should be true. Okay? Uh, and so we can ask... Again, the question, so is there a way in this 54-dimensional space of potential solution theories, are there some uh, that satisfies this kind of E to isometry in some sense, in the sense that if you make two different choices of these sigmas that generate the same metric uh, or the same sub riemannian metric or something, um, you know, does this correspond to the same solutions in law? Now, there's a kind of meta-theorem that you can prove um, which basically says, well, if you have some approximation procedure which satisfies a certain symmetry, then it's possible to choose these renormalization constants in such a way that this limit also satisfies the symmetry in question. Okay? Um, now, of course, again, this is not unique. It's only unique up to you know, if I add to these constants a counterterm in such a way that that counterterm satisfies that symmetry, uh, then of course I'm going to get a new solution theory which still satisfies the symmetry, right? So this certainly in general cannot completely characterize um, my solution theories. Uh, now this meta theorem is sort of, so this is actually extremely easy to prove uh, with a couple of ingredients, like the ones I had on the previous slide. Um, so let me actually show you the proof. Um, so what we do is we exploit the fact that, so these things are sort of quite explicit. So in particular, we know how the um, counter term, how, what's the homogeneity in the sigma. So we know that these epsilons, well, you know, most of these trees that I showed you, they had sort of four round leaves which basically means that this gives you terms that are four homogeneous in sigma. So it means that if I multiply sigma by some constant alpha, the corresponding counter term will be multiplied by alpha to the four. Okay? Um, and we also remember we had this very strong continuity property. So then what I could do is I could choose an alpha, an alpha which depends on epsilon, and which is such that alpha to the four times this diverging constant C epsilon actually converges to a finite limit. Okay, so I just choose alpha to be one over the fourth root of some kind of norm of the C epsilon. Okay. Um, and so then I call H the, uh, or there should have been an epsilon in front, right? So there's like the counter term, so that the counter term that corresponds uh, to the C epsilons converges to a finite limit. Okay, so I call that finite limit H or minus H. Now this a priori is not a vector field, right? Because these counter terms, they're kind of formal expressions in the sigmas and the gammas. They satisfy Einstein's convention, so they kind of look like they should be vector fields, but these gammas don't transform like a tensor because they are Christoffel symbols, and therefore just because you satisfy Einstein's convention doesn't actually mean that you're a vector field. Uh, because you have these gammas showing up. Um, anyway, so now what I do is I look at the solution. So for example, think, so here I'm thinking about the symmetry of equivariance under changes of coordinates. Okay? So there's a natural way of approximating the, approximating the equation, which is simply replace your white noise by some kind of smoothened out noise. Then everything is smooth, 
it, per it behaves perfectly fine under changes of coordinates, right? So at epsilon fixed, everything behaves perfectly fine under changes of coordinates. And so I look at the equation that I started with, but with alpha epsilon multiplying the noises and say no vector field, no additional vector field. And now that zero here, I can of course just write it as H epsilon plus this, right? So H epsilon was defined as minus this quantity, so there's the epsilon missing here. Um, so I replace zero by that. Um, and then that H epsilon by assumption, by basically by construction, converges to some limit H, at least along a subsequence, just by some compactness in. Um, and so I know that this solution here converges to this solution here, right? Because we, in the previous theorem, I remember we said that, well, these gammas and sigmas and so on, we're allowed to make them depend on epsilon in any way, and actually the theorem tells you that you still converge to simply the limit that you think of formally, so this guy converges to zero, this guy converges to h, and this guy doesn't change. So you get this limit here. But now the left-hand side is equivariant under changes of variables, right? So that's for fixed epsilon. Um, and the right-hand side, I mean, all of these things are, this is a Christopher symbol, these are vector fields, zero is a vector field. So this is equivariant under changes of coordinates. Therefore, that limit has to be as well, because this guy is just a limit of these guys here, uh, and therefore H has to be a vector field. Okay, because if H were in the vector field, I could actually always find some initial condition and some two coordinates in such a way that I get a contradiction. Okay, so you have basically a two-line argument here that tells you, well, it doesn't quite tell you uh, what I said, but at least it tells you that the, uh, if these constants diverge, they would diverge in a direction that corresponds to a vector field, and therefore you can sort of imagine that you can actually choose them in such a way that um, uh, the limit satisfies the changes of coordinates formula. Okay, and you can do a similar kind of argument for the uh, Ito formula thing. Oops, what's happening here? Okay, so now, so here what it tells you is that, well, you can choose these solution theories in such a way that the naive change of, formula, change of coordinates formula holds. No fancy Ito formula or something, just normal changes of coordinates, normal rules of calculus, um, and it reduces the degrees of freedom, right? So now you have to choose it in such a way that uh, all your counter terms are vector fields. It turns out that now you have 15 degrees of freedom left instead of 54, okay? So you've reduced it, but it's still not great. And we can do a similar argument for these Ito type isometry that tells you, well, you can also find solution theories that somehow satisfy this Ito isometry. And there's, well, a 19 dimensional sort of set of them. Um, now the problem is that these sets, they are not like linear subspaces uh, of the space of counter terms because this space naturally doesn't actually have a linear structure. I mean, it looks like a linear space. I just told you that it's formal linear combinations of these symbols, um, but the natural structure, it has a natural group structure actually. Um, which isn't simply addition uh, on that vector space. And so the natural operation here is really that group operation. Um, and so these sets of solution theories are naturally somehow cosets of certain subgroups of that group. So you have two cosets of two subgroups of that group. Uh, and basically here that really means that it's kind of two affine spaces. So you have an affine space of dimension 15, another affine space of dimension 19. Uh, this affine space corresponds to solution theories that satisfy the change of variables formula. The other one corresponds to solution theories that satisfy something like E to isometry. And there are two affine spaces that live in a space of dimension 54. Now, 15 plus 19 is of course much less than 54, right? So generically, there's no reason for these two affine spaces to intersect, okay? There would, if I had, right, so this meta theorem, of course I could have just said, well, I have these two symmetries, I can just mash them together, so it's like one big symmetry. Um, so that would tell you that I have a solution theory that satisfies this one big symmetry. The problem is that a crucial 
ingredient here is I needed a way of approximating the equation that satisfies that symmetry. And we don't know of any way of approximating the equation which satisfies simultaneously both of these symmetries. Okay, and so then you're kind of stuck. Um, it turns out that magically, these two spaces do intersect, okay? And so that's the thing that took us a long time to kind of figure out. Uh, so these two spaces, which have no a priori reason to intersect, it turns out, you know, we see at the very end, so it's like there's an anal analogous story in the case of usual stochastic differential equations, where this 54-dimensional space is really a one-dimensional space, which kind of parametrizes the Ito Stratonovich correction or something. Uh, and in the usual case of stochastic differential equation, there's exactly the same story happening, uh, and there is no solution theory which simultaneously satisfies E2 isometry and the change of variables formula, okay? So in the case of SDEs, if you take the simple finite dimensional case as a guidance, then that would tell you that these two spaces should not intersect, okay? Because in that very simple case, you have two zero-dimensional spaces of a one-dimensional space. There are two points and these two points are just not the same point, okay? Whereas here, it turns out that they do actually intersect, which is kind of miraculous. Um, and they don't just intersect on a point, they actually intersect in a subspace of dimension two, okay? So we can show that it intersects in a subspace of dimension two, and so now we're down to two degrees of freedom, right? So now you have a two-parameter fami family of solution theories, which simultaneously satisfy all the symmetries that you can kind of formally write down for your class of equations. Okay, so that's somehow very natural uh, solution theories. Um, but still there's two degrees of freedom left. So you can get rid of uh, one of them because you say, well, at the, for every point on your manifold, you can find a normal coordinate system. So in that normal coordinate system, that's sort of the coordinate system in which a little neighborhood around that point looks as flat as possible, okay? So it looks as much as possible like just a copy of Rn, okay? And so then what you would think is, well, since if the space is flat, then the gammas are zero and the sigmas are constant, your, our equation is simply a heat equation with an additive noise term. It's perfectly well posed. There's no need for any counter terms or anything. And so what we would expect is that if we put ourselves in normal coordinates for a given point, then the counter terms should actually vanish at that point, right? Because at that point, our equation sort of really looks like just as much as possible like a heat equation uh, with additive noise, and that one doesn't need any randomization or anything. And so it turns out that it's possible to impose this as an extra condition, uh, and that gets rid of one more of these two degrees of freedom. Okay, so now you're sort of down to uh, one degree of freedom left. Um, and in the natural geometric case, so in the case where the gammas are really the Christoffel symbols uh, for a Riemannian metric and the sigmas are so that sigma-sigma transpose gives you the same metric, so it means that there's actually a link between the gammas and the sigmas. They're not completely independent. So in that particular case, all elements on this one parameter family coincide. Okay, so they're actually all the same. And so now you have actually just one completely canonical notion of what it means to be a solution. Okay? Um, so, so then you can kind of go back, remember the little story I told you at the very beginning, so there was this kind of big controversy, or it's not really a controversy, it really sort of just depends on what you mean by Lebesgue measure on the space of loops, right, which has no meaning. Um, but now, in some sense, that gives us a value of C in this context, right? Because you say, well, I have a completely canonical notion of solution, um, so there's only one value of C for which the invariant measure for that equation should actually be the Brownian loop measure, right? Because for different values of C, they should differ by the Gesanov factor, which is e to the integral of the scalar curvature. Um, so in this particular case, so the conjecture is that it's one over eight. So it was one of the <laughs> one of the many values that kind of show up in the physics literature. Uh, so it seems that ours sort of coincides with 
one of those, but it doesn't really mean that that one is more correct or anything, right? So it just means that somehow the formal interpretation of what it means to be Lebesgue -like measure on the space of loops is sort of closest to the one that was given by that particular formal derivation somehow. Um, the interesting fact is, remember, so, so we had we had things down to two parameters at some point, and then I said, well, you can make this argument with normal coordinates and so on to sort of remove one of them. And that one was sort of, it was a different argument from the others, right? So the other arguments were purely symmetry arguments, whereas this one is more of an analytical kind of argument. So it's sort of less canonical. It gives you a natural way of choosing an origin somewhere, but it's not as intrinsic somehow, right? So you could have chosen it somehow differently, and turns out different choices precisely correspond to uh, adding terms that are proportional to gradient of scalar curvature. Okay, so one of the so in these two degrees of freedom, one of them, the one that we fixed by this choice of normal coordinates, that one precisely corresponds to gradient of scalar curvature. Okay, so that's really one of the ones that showed up earlier. The other one is some more complicated contraction of the curvature tensor. Uh, with the metric and the gradient of the metric, which happens to vanish if the curvature tensor is Levi Civita for that metric, um, but doesn't need to vanish in general. Okay, so the last five minutes, I just want to show you. Um, well, so remember, I mentioned like 10 minutes ago that if we had if we took as our, as our guidance somehow the intuition coming from the finite dimensional situation, then we would reach the wrong conclusion, right? So the sort of the finite dimensional situation suggests that these two spaces should not intersect. So let me just show you why that's the case, or somehow give you a little bit of a hint of uh, what's the reason in that case why. So, so remember we have this space of formal linear combinations of symbols. Some combinations of these symbols give you vector fields. Um, so let me call that S geometric. So S was somehow all formal linear combination of symbols, but each symbol, remember there was that epsilon map that basically transforms a symbol into a map from Rn to Rn, but it's not just a map from Rn to Rn, it's really a whole, right, like in every coordinate system it does that, so there is really a notion of whether that thing is a vector field or not. Um, so then there are, there's one subspace, which are sort of the geometric ones, which spit out things that are vector fields. So that was that 15-dimensional subspace. And then there's another one, which is the sort of eta ones, which is the one that spits out, right? So it spits out expression that depend on the gammas and the sigmas. And then some of these expressions might be such that it actually really just depends on gamma and G, where G was sort of sigma sigma transpose, okay? But some of them may not. Uh, and so the S eta is those expressions that really only depend on gamma and G, right? um, And so then there's actually a space S both that you can define, which has sort of, well, some of both of these, uh, which is defined like that, so that's those uh, formal linear combination of sort of symbols, which is such that if I now look at this epsilon map for two different sigmas, for two different choices of sigmas that give you the same G, and I look at the difference and I apply it to that symbol, and then you want that to be a vector field. Okay? So now it's clear that if the tau is in this geometric thing, well, then each of these two guys separately is a vector field, and so the difference is a vector field. If it's in this Ito thing, then these two guys give you the same answer, so the difference is zero, and zero is always a vector field, okay? So clearly, this space has to contain both of these spaces, so it has to be at least as big as the sum of these two spaces. Um, and the crucial step in our proof is the observation that in the case of these SPDs, that space is actually equal to the sum of these spaces. And that's really an ingredient, the crucial ingredient, which somehow, because basically what we show is that we have these two affine spaces, 
Uh, and we show that basically if you take a vector that takes a point from one of these spaces and maps it to a point on the other space, we show that that vector has to actually be in this space here. And then if this space is just the sum of these two spaces, that actually means that the two spaces have to intersect. Okay? Uh, and so that was the crucial observation. And so now what I claim is that for SDEs, they don't. Because for SCEs, there's only one symbol that shows up, um, which sort of corresponds to this one, and the epsilon would give you this, right? So remember, uh, this is a copy of the sigma, this is a copy of the sigma, this means derivative, and then you have contraction of indices, so really the, that one has an upper index which gets contracted with the lower index of that derivative. Now, this thing is not a vector field, okay? So it doesn't because it, to be a vector field, it should be something like a covariant derivative, right? So it should be, this is not a covariant derivative, uh, so it doesn't behave correctly under changes of coordinates. Um, so which means that this S geometric has to be just zero, okay? Because, well, the only elements are the ones proportional to that. It's not a vector field, and therefore this guy is empty, or it's zero space. Um, and same for the Eto thing, so that thing I mean, it's quadratic in sigma, but it cannot be just written as a function of sigma sigma transpose. Okay, so it doesn't pair up in the right way. Um, and so the other space is also zero. But this symbol does actually belong to this space, because if I take that difference, then that is actually a difference of covariant derivatives, because the way you would write the covariant derivative is this term here plus a contraction of the sigma by the Christoffel symbols. But when you contract the sigma with the Christoffel symbols, what that really means, it's really the contraction of sigma sigma transpose with the Christoffel symbol. And so if you take two sigmas that give you the same sigma sigma transpose, that just cancels out here. Okay? And so this difference would actually be a difference of covariant derivatives. And so this both space here uh, is actually the full space. Right? And so this identity here is not true in the case of SDEs, um, but it is true uh, in the case of, well, in the case that we're interested in, right? So in the case of the SPDs, if we look at only the simple symbols, so the ones with kind of two fat nodes, they are actually these, and so that guy still corresponds to the same expression, and that guy precisely corresponds to sort of the other expression so that the sum of the two is actually a covariant derivative. And so then this geometric thing is just the sum of the two, which is now actually sort of the, the same expression but with this derivative replaced by a covariant derivative. The Eto guy is that guy here, because this guy really just depends on sigma sigma transpose. Um, and, well, it turns out you can check that this both space uh, is actually everything. So, it's, so it is actually the sum of these two spaces. Um, and then it's a lot of pain to check that this is also true for the trees that have four of these fat leaves, right? Because there's 52 of them. Uh, and then you can't just sort of do some fiddling around and looking at these expressions. You have to actually understand the, the algebraic structure of that space. Right? So, so that's actually a big chunk of the, uh, of the work. Um, so, okay, so I think I stop here. So I, I wrote a couple of open questions here that are still interesting. Uh, but I'd like to thank you for your attention. <laughs> so this morning, the coffee break, there's time for a question or a comment. Okay, people are eager for coffee. Let's thank Martin again. Oh, let's... oh wait, 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 wait. Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, there's this toy regularity structure that you get from rough volatility, where you have a little bit of branching, and so the symbols are a little bit richer than in the SDE case that you presented. Mm -hmm. You don't just have this one stick but you have one branching or a few branches. Do you, but at the same time, it somehow it has a good eta structure. Yeah. Do, do you think that would be an example where you could get something similar in spirit 
but in a very elementary setting? Um, I wouldn't think so, actually. So, I mean, I would think that that would be similar to SDs, but uh, I might be wrong. But the, the thing is that you don't, you don't have a connection showing up naturally in that toy model either. Right. Right. And so, um, so you don't really have any way in which you would get covariant derivatives when you, you change variables. So I don't, yeah, I think that would be closer to the case of SDEs. Actually. And one second question. Uh, you pointed out that all these subspaces are affine linear of dimension 19 and 14 or something. But the group structure is not the, the, the usual one. So was it a surprise that it turned out affine? Or would oh, you have expected something nonlinear in the beginning? No, it's because, I mean, in this particular case, the group structure, uh, it basically is the linear one, actually. So in, in this special case, the group structure is basically the linear one. Okay. Because you can't, I mean, once you, once you remove, right, so in principle you have more symbols because then there's the ones but that would break some kind of x goes to minus x symmetry or something like that. So the, here you've already reduced it by exploiting some of the simple symmetries mm -hmm. and you kind of throw stuff away. And by the time you've reduced it to that, uh, the group structure is, a, so here the group structure is actually the affine structure. So in general it's not, but in this particular case it is. So, it's, okay, uh, so, so that's why you natural. just have affine spaces, okay. yeah. But in general these things would be co-sets. Yeah. Well, thank you very much again.